Well, welcome, friend. I'm so glad that you've chosen to be with us today. Grab your Bible and open it with me to John chapter 3. We're going to continue and round out uh, the rest of the verses that are found in John chapter 3. Um, I want to start reading to you, um, starting in verse 30. I know we read this last week, um, but I want to use this as a springboard for the last remaining verses of John chapter 3. So John chapter 3, starting in verse number 30, here's what the Bible says. It says, He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the word of God, for he gives a spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Somebody say amen to God's word. Just to give you some context here, these are words, in essence, this is a testimony of John the Baptist. What I read to you was John the Baptist's words. And in verse 30, he is conveying to his disciples that he should decrease and the Lord Jesus must increase. And verses 31 through 36 after that, these last remaining verses in John chapter 3, are John the Baptist's reason for decreasing. Another way to say it would be why John the Baptist chose to decrease or to give priority to Jesus. And in essence, this could be our why as well. Why we should allow Jesus to increase and why our will needs to take a backseat to his will. Now, if you think about it, the whys of your life, these are uh, what motivate you or spurn you to pursue what you desire. And I believe your actions in life and how you choose to live your life are a direct result of the whys of your life. Think of it this way, all right? Why don't you want to go to the bar anymore when you used to go multiple times a week? Why don't you play video games all day long and every day like you used to back when you were younger? Why don't you just charge whatever you want whenever you want on your credit card because you feel like it? I think if you've made decisions against those things and you've chosen a different path, it could be because the priorities of your life have changed. Something has happened to, uh, to, to point you in a new direction in life, which is the reason why you stop doing some of those things. When you choose to change your priorities, in essence, I believe it's because you found a better why. Listen, when it comes to faith, your priorities need to change when you find something more significant, more meaningful to desire or to pursue, and especially when it comes to life. When it comes to the kingdom of God, which believers are a part of, Jesus needs to become our priority. Who Jesus is needs to become our why. Our perspective about Jesus has to be that he is greater than anyone or anything that you and I can think of. And so I've made note of a few whys about Jesus that we ought to embed deep in our heart. And they're all pulled out of this passage right here. Some are, are, are just to expound. I, I wanted to pull some from other uh, areas of scripture as well. But um, in essence, there's four whys that you can write down. Okay, so the first why. Number one, Jesus is greater. Say that to your neighbor. Jesus is greater. Jesus wasn't just an exceptionally spiritual man or an exceptionally wise man. John wanted to make sure that everyone knew that he was and is God and that he came from heaven. Listen, if your faith is to grow or advance in any way, this is a good place to start. That Jesus comes from above and that he is above all. He who comes from heaven is above all. Somebody say amen to that. Remember, John the Baptist was someone that people followed, 
And so people followed him like a rabbi or a teacher. And in those days, the teaching was solely about the Torah and, you know, which is the Torah, if you don't know what that is, it's the teachings of Moses. It's basically the first five books of the Old Testament. They included the prophets in that as well. And rabbis would teach. And, and Moses was considered to be one of the greatest prophets in all of the Old Testament or in, their in that time of Jesus. That's what they believed at least. So in addition to John the Baptist's statement that Jesus is from above and is above all, the author, some authors in the New Testament now echo and express the same statement. So if you look at Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3, this is what the Bible says. It says, For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. So in essence, the author of Hebrews is saying that Jesus is greater than Moses. Jesus is greater and Think of this in context. Like I said, everybody viewed Moses as the ultimate prophet. Here, John is basically saying, no, Jesus is greater than that. Jesus is greater even than Moses. Moses, the greatest witness and teacher in all of Israel up to that point in time, is now surpassed by Jesus. And, you know, not just the author of Hebrews, but Paul says the exact same thing about Jesus as well. In Ephesians 1, 20, Paul says that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority, far above all power and dominion, far above every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him, Jesus, as head over all things to the church. Paul says the same thing in essence that John the Baptist is saying, that after his death and resurrection, Jesus went back to being seated at the right hand of the Father in the heavenly places above all. Once again, Jesus is above. And he's not just above. I love how he words it in verse number 21. He says that he is far above all. In other words, there's no close second here. He's far above all, far above all rule and authority, far above all power and dominion. He is far above all, every name that is named, not just the prophets, not just the teachers and the wise people that day, but ever. Jesus is far above all of them. Listen, friend, Jesus is greater and there will never be anyone greater than Jesus. So if you need another reason to decrease and to make Jesus become your chief priority, take this first point of John here and then own it, all right? There is no one, nor will there ever be anyone greater than Jesus. And it should be a no-brainer that you and I follow his lead. Somebody say amen to that. The second why of John's why, Jesus, so to speak, is that, number two, Jesus is the most qualified to talk about the kingdom of heaven. Look at verse 32. He says, he bears witness to what he has seen and heard. He is the most qualified to talk about the kingdom of heaven because he literally came from there. Think of it this way. All right. If for whatever reason you were going to move into my house and you were wondering what it would be like when you move into my house, who would be better at letting you know what you'll experience than the owner of the house who lives there? Someone who has seen, heard, and experienced what happens in that house. Not that I want all of y'all to move in, but I'm just using this as an illustration now. Jesus didn't just hear a message about God and repeat it. He's not like the angel Gabriel who was given messages to speak. He's different from the prophets of the Old Testament because he wasn't given a glimpse to what the Father desires. Jesus was there with God the Father. Jesus was there in heaven. Jesus is the best and most qualified witness because he is from heaven. He has experience of heaven because that's where he's from. Listen to me. The quality of any witness is determined by what they have personally seen and heard. And you think you can think of this, you know, in a courtroom type setting. When they call people to the witness stand, they want people to give testimony of what they've seen and heard. Those people they call witnesses. When you get like someone that is was literally right there. Someone that was on the scene, they call him a star witness. In essence, Jesus would be a star witness because he's 
he's bearing witness to what he's experienced and seen from God the Father and seen in the kingdom of heaven. And so that's the kind of witness that you and I have. You know, one commentary that I read, it said that seeing and hearing are equivalent to having direct knowledge. And this is one of the many reasons that we make that makes Jesus so great is because from him we get direct knowledge about the kingdom of heaven from the only one who has seen, heard and experienced the kingdom of heaven personally and that is king Jesus. Somebody say amen to that. And because he is from there, then that gives his word so much weight, which brings me to the next why. Number 3. Jesus has the words of life and has the full measure of the Holy Spirit. Verse 34, it says, For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives a spirit without measure. Now, if you look ahead, you don't have to turn there, but in John chapter 6, Jesus preaches a hard truth. In front of everybody, he says this. He says, Truly, truly, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will have no life in you. <laughs> and then as a result of that, in John uh 6 verse 36 it's people call it one of the saddest uh, verses in the bible because jesus in essence gets canceled if you know anything about the cancel culture today you know you post something wrong on on social media boy they ostracize you they cancel you there's people that have lost uh positions lost jobs lost um, any kind of equity for status in life because of what they've said cancel culture will just cancel you and hear you. This is might as well be cancel culture in Jesus's time. Because in verse 66, it says that after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. The only people that remained with Jesus were the 12. And in this context, Jesus turns to the 12 and he asks them, do you want to go, as way, go away as well? Peter spoke up and he answered and he sent to, said something so profound to me. He said, to whom shall we go? To whom? In other words, where else are we going to go? He says, you have the words of life. Peter knew it. The remaining disciples knew it. All the writers of the New Testament knew it, that Jesus uttered the words of God. He spoke out of authority from his unique perspective about the kingdom of God. And as a result, Jesus speaks the words of eternal life. And if you think about it, this Bible that we carry, this is a collection of what God says about himself and his kingdom. Because he came from heaven, he gives us direct knowledge about it in the full measure of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit inspired the writers of this book to count for these words so that you and I may have it. Aren't you thankful that God thought everything through and that we have this as a guide that we don't have to rely on this, because I don't know about you, but relying on this doesn't, doesn't work a lot of the times. That we, we get to rely on this as our guide. Um, and that we have the words of life, the words of eternal life written in here so that we can look upon it and embed them into our heart. I'm so thankful for that. Now the fourth why. Why should you decrease and allow Jesus to increase in your life? Well, because God the Father trusted Jesus enough to give him all authority. And if the Father trusts Jesus, then we should too. Verse 35, it says that the Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Jesus, the Son of God, who became flesh to dwell among us. He's basically God with skin on. Jesus didn't just come with the approval of God the Father. He came with the full authority of God the Father. And so because the Father trusts him, I don't know about you, but I'm going to trust him too. So as we close, I hope that this is helpful to you. You know, my role in essence is basically to be your guide as we examine the scriptures together. I think by be, being a guide to you, it allows more of the Holy Spirit to speak to you. Um, the Holy Spirit talks to me and he leads me in the way that that uh, I should lead you, uh, so to speak. But I want to make sure that you have room for the Holy Spirit to speak on you as well by every passage that you and I study, um, through every passage that you and I um, read and, and try to embed in our heart and ask the Lord, Lord, how can I be obedient to this part today? 
So as we close, I want to look at this last verse because this last verse in chapter three is a pretty important one. It speaks a lot of volume and, but also I think a lot of people just kind of glaze over it or skip it altogether. But verse 36 says this, whoever believes in the son has eternal life, but whoever does not obey the son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. The wrath of God. John's gospel is the only one that mentions the wrath of God. Out of the four Bible, uh, four uh, gospels, his is the only one that mentions it. Um, just do, doing a, a brief overlook, you know, of, of the whole Bible, the wrath of God is mentioned 180 times in the Bible. I think that a lot of people have abused the teaching of it, of this concept of the wrath of God or this understanding of the wrath of God. And I think as a result, they've misled people into thinking that God is an angry God. He's not an angry God. But because a lot of people have abused the teaching of this, it doesn't mean that you and I should skip the teaching of this verse. So I want to make sure that, that we talk about it just in closing here. Here's what I want you to understand about the wrath of God. Is that the wrath of God is not a moment of anger or temporary agitation. You know, like maybe your kids didn't do the dishes so you get mad as a parent. God is not like that. He doesn't get mad for a moment. It's not, you know, oh, he's just an, he's annoyed at you. He did, that's not how God is. I think a better way to describe the wrath of God would be that this is God's ultimate necessary and righteous action against evil. You have to remember that God is holy and that God is just. Jesus came to save the people of God and therefore justified him in the eyes of God by becoming the sacrifice for us. So here's the thing about that justification though. That justification only happens by belief in Jesus, by trusting in his work and not your work, not my work, not our own work. John is basically conveying that man in essence only has two options. You either trust in the son, Jesus, or you either reject the son. Look, we have to understand that unbelief is tragic ignorance, but it is also willful disobedience to clear light. Remember, the light came in to the world and the light exposes darkness. But if you are willfully disobedient and you reject Jesus, in essence, you're being willfully disobedient to clear light. Endless sin and endless disobedience will most certainly result in endless punishment. But those who trust in Jesus, come on now, those who trust in Jesus, who submit to the Lordship of King Jesus, they get to experience endless life. As if you need another reason to add this to the many reasons of why we need Jesus, why we need to prioritize him, why we need to not only love him, but surrender to his lordship. It's because of this. God has made a way in Jesus for you to uh, subvert the wrath of God. That you won't uh, um, be part of those who are punishment because of the justness of God. He is a just God. And if you are willfully disobedient to him, if you willfully go astray and go a different way in your life, you will encounter that wrath. The wrath remains on that person. But if you choose Jesus, if you trust Jesus, if, you, if you've found depth in yourself to embrace the why, I should follow Jesus because he is greater, because he's the only one that can give us perspective of heaven and what it's like to be in the presence of God the Father. And because if God the Father trusts him, then why shouldn't I trust him? He has the words of life. He's been given the full measure of the Holy Spirit while the Holy Spirit has been poured out previously on other people, and it's only been given in doses, Jesus had the full measure of the Holy Spirit, and you compound the, the, the fact that he utters the words of God. Why wouldn't you take these words that Jesus speaks and follow them and obey them so that you and I could find eternal life? This is why we need Jesus, and this is why we ought to decrease so that he can increase. As we close, let me, let me, let me pray with you. And um, I'm going to release you to, to your house church. And if you're, maybe you're not at a house church, maybe you're just watching this with some friends or with some family, I encourage you, go deeper. Challenge yourself. Ask, your quest, ask, ask the group questions, um, you know, within the context of our gathering. To me, 
this is one of the neat things about this season is we get to be challenged and we get to challenge others into going deeper into the scripture. So let me pray and then I encourage you to go deeper. Father, we love you so much and we're so thankful for this time with you. Lord, as we dig deeper, as we allow you, Holy Spirit, to examine the depths of our heart, I pray, God, that we would uh, be revealed all the amazing things, God, of why you sent your son, Jesus. And then we would find more reason, God, to obey. For more reason, Lord, to follow your way. More reason, God, to pursue you diligently. We thank you, Father, for all that you're doing in our midst today. And we look forward to all that you're going to do in the future. We honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.